on this edition of the Rebel Report, March Madness has arrived to the Valley and we'll give you a look at how the run-in Rebels and the Lady Rebels did in the Mountain West Tournament. We'll also get you familiar with the newest edition of Sports at UNLV and take you to the ball game to witness the incredible start of the Rebels baseball season. Then it's off to the racetrack to see everything that happened during NASCAR weekend. All this and more. The report starts right now. Welcome back to The Rebel Report. This is our second show of season five, and we got a lot of stories to share with you. I'm Michaela Jackson. And I'm Cecilia Heston. We'll also catch you up on anything that you may have missed out on, the racetrack during NASCAR weekend, and introduce you to a type of sport that is becoming more and more popular. But first, but first let's talk about basketball. March Madness has arrived to Vegas, and with that comes a variety of tournaments held across the valley. Yeah, but one of our most concerned with is the Mountain West Conference Tournament held right here on campus of UNLV. The Run and Rebels started play with a seed that no team would want, stuck in a play-in game versus Air Force on March 7th. After being on a five-game losing streak, the Run-In Rebels look to turn that around in their first Mountain West Conference game. UNLV, who is the eighth seed, played Air Force, who is the ninth seed. UNLV led the first half 37-33 to and looked to continue rolling into the second half. But with a minute left in the second half, the Falcons looked to the ball looked to the ball game as a goal 10 was called on Brandon McCoy and as a foul was called on Mblake Jong, Air Force made the one and, and one free throw to tie the game and send it to overtime. The Rebels took over in OT and would beat Air Force 97 to 90. McCoy finished with 23 points and three blocks as the Rebels survived and advanced to the next round. You know, we knew it was going to be a fight. We were very prepared to play this type of game, especially after the two previous games where uh, they were both closed games. And we were happy to come out on the winning side. It's uh, survive in advance, as they say. Uh, it, it wasn't anything, you know, special. Uh, you know, Coach gave us a game plan to follow, and, you know, we just kept reminding each other that we got to get a stop, you know, and we got the stops when we need them, you know, and, uh, they're a great team, you know, they're tough to guard, you know, they put us in a lot of actions, you know, and uh, they got a lot of easy buckets, you know, just because they play that hard offensively. But uh, we got the stops that we needed down the stretch. With that victory, the Rebels now reach the 20-win mark and move on to the second round of the tournament. At this time we're taping this episode, the run-in Rebels are literally in the middle of their game against UNR. So this is the only time we can pull out our phones here. So UNR is up 68 to 59 with five minutes and 45 seconds left of the game. And, then, and the men were not the only ones to take part in the madness. The Lady Rebels did too. That's right, the women's basketball team went up against Reno on March 6th for the quarterfinals of the Mountain West Tournament, which turned out to be quite a nail-biter. It was non-stop fighting from both sides as the second-seeded UNLV took on the seventh-seed UNR in a game that went into double overtime. The Rebels kept a lead the entire game. It wasn't until the fourth quarter when Reno finally caught up. With only 42 seconds left in the game, the score was tied 61-61, with both teams missing their next shots, propelling the game into overtime. It wasn't until overtime that UNR took its first lead of the game. Less than a minute into the extra period, point guard Nikki Wheatley, who had been leading the Rebels with 18 points, had to sit out due, a, due to a calf cramp and remained out for most of the remainder of the game. UNR then tried to grab a lead but were stopped when senior Brooke Johnson scored five straight points to tie the game 68-68 and sending it into another overtime. UNR continued to score while the Lady Rebels missed most of their shots, especially free throws. The game eventually ended with UNR taking the win 77-73. UNLV had a free throw percentage of 52-6, while UNR had one of 90.9%. .9%. 
something that both the coach and players say was the main cause of the upset. I'm a little um, upset that we just we didn't make our free throws down the stretch, and they did. I mean, the, the game really comes down to that. Outside of free throws, probably just the rebounding. Uh, you know, we're a top rebounding team in our conference, and just getting more OB rebounds, being more aggressive on the rebounding probably would have gave us more possessions. Yeah, um, it's about the same and definitely has been a roller coaster for all of us. But uh, it's like Nikki said, just a couple of things that we should have fixed and maybe done differently or went for that extra loose ball, that extra board, and that makes the difference in the game or making the last shot in the regular um, play. Brooke Johnson ended the game with 19 points, Nikki Wheatley with 18, followed by Juniper Paris Strother with 14. While the loss on March 6 stings, the UNLV women's basketball team capitalized the end of their regular season with yet another win and, for the first time in UNLV history, named conference champions. Jafar Robso joins us live in studio to tell us about the major accomplishment. Thanks guys. What was supposed to be an emotional senior night for some Lady Rebels turned out to be an exciting celebration as the team was named Mountain West Champions on March 2nd. All good things sadly must come to an end, which was the case for three Lady Rebel seniors, but they didn't leave empty handed. Kennedy Wharton, Simone Shepard, and point guard Brooke Johnson played in what could have been their last Lady Rebels game. Brooke Johnson, who would go on to put on an outstanding performance, tying her career high of five threes and having a game high with 22 points, along with three steals and four assists. This would give them the victory over Utah State. It's been great. I've, my whole goal this entire season has been doing whatever it takes to get my team on top. and. I feel for the conference itself, I've actually accomplished that. The win over the Aggies included a new trophy for the display case as the team celebrated their first ever Mountain West Conference title. I can't say enough about every last one of them. Kennedy we've only had for two years, but she's a local from Las Vegas. She's a team favorite. Everyone loves her energy. Her enthusiasm is off the charts. Mo Shepard comes to work hard every single day. She's a worker every single day. She'll do whatever we ask. And then Brooke, I can't say enough positive things about her. I mean, she's, she can do everything on the floor. She sets up her teammates. She's the best defensive player, no doubt, in the conference. She can bomb threes. Um, no, about, no doubt one of the best players in the conference, if not the best. This season, Brooke Johnson was named Defensive Player of the Year in the Mountain West. Her goal moving forward is to play somewhere professionally. However, I'm pretty sure she would still love to play for the Lady Rebels as they're playing for a spot in the WNIT. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Jafar. And we'll find out if the Lady Rebs do get picked for the WNIT on March 12th when selection happens. In conjunction with the men and women's basketball Mountain West Tournament, UNLV Esports competes in one of the school's largest esports events. The gaming community is growing, and UNLV esports players are teaming up for one single mission, bring home the trophy. Marco Santander and I got the chance to see what all the hype is about. We're here at the Mountain West Conference Esports Showdown practice. Let's take a look into what a practice looks like for an esports tournament. 8-Bit Esports is a UNLV team that was founded in 2012 and is one of the largest student organizations on campus. It includes three main teams, Overwatch, an undefeated League of Legends team, and Rocket League. Well, we do a lot of training on our own, like in like pairs and like trios, like to work on our individual team synergy. But then we have our scrimmages, where we do our scrim matches against other teams. And so, for example, we're going to be having a scrim against UNR today. Uh, and we'll do those like three times a week. There'll be like two hour sessions that we have set with other universities or with other set teams where we play. And we work on our strategies. And, work better for tournaments. Nice, push up, push up, push. While the team has competed before, they have never done something quite as big as this tournament. And I'm glad that we have an event like that going on in the first place. Like, this is the first semester ever that we're having, like, a Mountain West Conference actual sports, you know, event going on for esports, and that's really cool. 
The legitimacy of having their own conference tournament gives 8-bit team members like Evan Smith a chance to see his team compete in a large event for school pride. I used to compete locally on a competitive level and it was like, here's an open space in a library, like you'll have a projector, have fun type thing. And now it's grown into such a big thing. Now 8-Bit has the support of Caesars Palace after the hotel donated new computers to the team so they can all practice together in their facility to help prepare them for competitions even past the Mountain West Conference. Esports is continuing to grow among UNLV students and Las Vegas locals. For Rebel Report, I'm Cecilia Heston. And I'm Marco Santander. It seems like esports is getting bigger and bigger. It is, and the Runnin' Reinhardts will face Boise State for the Mountain West Conference this weekend. And on March 22nd, the Luxor is opening the Strip's first permanent esports venue. UNLV's track and field team makes history with their first indoor title in 25 years. Sarah Coker has more on this amazing victory. The Rebels finished 14 points ahead of second place Colorado State. I had the chance to speak with coach Yvonne Wade about how she led the team to victory. The Rebels racked up 99 points in total to win at the Mountain West Indoor Championships in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The team is led by Yvonne Wade, who has recently announced Coach of the Year for the second year in a row. Wade has been a key figure to the team's success. Um, you know, winning Coach of the Year is always a great honor. I, you know, our team has worked really hard for it, but, you know, I can't take all the credit for it. Obviously, I have a great team. They worked really hard for this accomplishment to win. Um, I have a wonderful staff, so it's, a, it's been a team effort, so that trophy and those awards go to all of us. Competing was not the only obstacle the track and field team had to face. While on the road in Albuquerque, many personal items and team equipment was stolen from their vans. Assistant coach Debris Harris and sophomore Keisha Love talk about how the team handled it. I didn't happen to my event group um, two years ago, so it was I didn't get particularly robbed individually this particular time. So that that two years ago for me, it gave me a little bit more experience for that call that good or bad. But it was a uh, just wait for myself and uh, a couple of others just to help the rest of the team walk through it. But you know, just make sure we you know, keep our uh, eyes on the objective. Hopefully it helps that we all go through this together. Like it's one thing to have to go by, go through this by yourself, but it's a whole different ball game to go through it with your sisters and your teammates. And better yet, our coaches are always the biggest support system. So to be able to have a support system like we do just made it so much easier to be able to deal with certain things like this. Like we were just built for anything to come our way for their events. Freshman Avi Tal Pertet had the 14th fastest 800 meter in the nation this season and the third fastest freshman performance. Coach Yvonne Wade says she hopes for the team to be recognized on a national level. For the Rebel Report, I'm Sarah Coker. UNLV freshman Avi Pertet will be competing nationally at the 2018 NCAA Indoor Championships for the 800 meter. It's been a great season so far for the Rebel baseball team as it's ranked nationally for the first time since 2014. Currently ranked number 23 with a 12-2 winning record. On March 2nd, the Rebels open conference play at Early Wilson Stadium. March 2nd kicks off the Rebel baseball team hosting the Fresno State Bulldogs for a three-game series for the Mountain West. Fresno State jumped out to an early 3-0 lead. The Rebels, however, battled right back scoring six in the third inning before closing out the win by a score of seven. Kyle Isbell put the first run on the scoreboard for the Rebels. He talks about earning the Mountain West Player of the Week. I just go out to the field every day and just play as hard as I can and just help my team win in any way possible, whether that's hitting, defense, or whatever it is. I just try to help the team win. Nick Ames at bat pushes UNLV ahead 4-3 to three in the third inning. Bryson Stott reflects on being named to the Mountain West preseason all-conference team alongside Isbell. It feels good. I mean, you want to go out and play as hard as you can every game, and to get rewarded for stuff you did last year preseason is pretty awesome, but going out with my teammates is, is even better. Coach Stan Stolte explains the team's improvement from last season and what they can do to maintain their winning streak. The makeup is the leadership has been outstanding, and, uh, but, you know, we hit and better, we're hitting better and we're taking pride in our defense this year. Uh, it's, it's given us a chance and we're finishing the game. So this game could have gone either way. Fresno's a good team and, and you know, it was a one-run game. We just have to keep playing great baseball every night. The Rebels won against the Fresno State Bulldogs for their first game on March 2nd in the three-game series. I'm Haley Jorgis for Rebel Report. 
The Rebels are set to play another three-day tournament against Iowa State starting March 9th. And now let's toss it over to Lupita with this week's Rebel Report timeout. Rebel Report timeout! Thanks, guys. And with us today, we have Coach Kathy Olivier from the Ladies Rebel. She's the Lady Re Rebels head coach. Thank you for joining us, Coach. We love having you. I know you come back. And thank you for coming on such a short notice. And you just had a big championship and big game. Just tell us we know what happened. Just tell us, like, your thoughts on what went wrong here. Because you were supposed Well, I, I like to talk about the championship. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us to win the Mountain West Conference Championship was great. Yeah. Um, we come into the tournament yeah. and our first rounds against um, Nevada. Yeah. And... I mean, things were going well. We played really well. We played hard. We played together. Um, a couple things we did all year we didn't do in this game. We didn't make our free throws, and we didn't rebound. And Nevada's a good team. They're playing well right now, and they took advantage of that. They made their free throws. We didn't make ours. They rebounded. We didn't, and that was the difference. Double overtime game. It was hard because we disappointed. We know we disappointed a lot of people, but um, we still hope we're going to be playing in the WNIT. Yeah. And you said that you guys got the championship, you won the um, yeah, Mount West Championship. Uh, what do you think you guys did right this year that, you know, led to this, this year, uh, like, as opposed to other years? Right. Um, this year, you know, we had really good leadership. Brooke Johnson and Nikki Wheatley were our leaders. And if you just say those two, that wouldn't be true because then you have people like Paris Strother and and Katie and Alyssa Anderson stepping up, and Jordan Bell. Like, we had so many different people step up at different times. Uh, we also felt that we played um, great defense. Defensively, um, we, we really overly emphasized our defense, and the team bought in. They worked extremely hard. And then, again, we talk about leadership, but we have so many weapons. We have so many weapons as far as offensive threats on the floor, and that's what makes a good team when you play together. And like to take it back to the beginning of the season, you played some tough teams. How did that prepare you for the rest of the season, you think? Yeah, we played some really um, tough non-conference teams, and our conference was very competitive this year. So our non-conference got us ready for the conference. We played Pac-12s. We played Mississippi State, mm -hmm. who's only lost one. They're ranked number two in the country right now. Um, Syracuse, another very good team. We beat Gonzaga at Gonzaga, who's um, right there on the brink of being ranked. We swept New Mexico, who has beaten ranked teams. So our team, you know, we just played really hard. We stayed together during those rough times because we had some difficult times when we played such mm -hmm. powerful non-conference schedule. Um, but they knew. They knew that we had a plan in mind, and that we always said that we wanted to win the Mountain West Conference Championship, and that's what they went out and did. And now uh, you're not losing too many seniors, but um, you are losing some really hard, you know, like you said, hard work, working players. Um, what do you think players like Nikki the, and Katie and Paris, what do they need to do to step up now for next season? Well, I, I feel like we have a lot of returners that will step up. Um, we lose three seniors. Brooke Johnson plays the most minutes. She's obviously one of our captains. She had a terrific year. Uh, we also lose Mo Shepard and Kennedy Wharton, who, you know, those all three of them play so hard and so competitive. But the other people, that's kind of what happens. You know, after you lose seniors, you build on the next year, and you come in, and there's always more expectations. There's always things they have to do better and improve in, as a player, and, and they will. Mm -hmm. They did last year. They, you know, they love that um, – there was that competition that they need to mm -hmm. they needed to step up and they did so i think they'll do it again they work hard in the off season they'll work hard again and the good thing is we have a lot of people coming back so mm -hmm. um, we're not ready to stop playing we want to play in the wnit but if we have to today then so be it and we'll be ready for next year so yeah and then the wnit you don't find out until march 12th right or the next yeah, March 12th? Um, well, I, I don't know the date, which is yeah. really scary because oh. I don't know dates right now oh. because we're coming oh, yeah. off, you know, the season and stuff. But we'll know on Monday night. So mm -hmm. Monday evening we find out. Uh, we'll leave Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning. Yes. And we know we're going on the road because there's mm -hmm. something going on um, in Cox. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
which is fine. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, we're a team that travels really well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it'll be great to get another game under our belt yeah. and uh, the team will be ready to go. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing you at the, hopefully at the WNIT. And thank you again for coming. Now, Thanks for having me. Now we're going to send it back. Uh, we're going to send it over to Naishan with the panel discussion. Thanks, Cage Co KO, for joining us today. We congratulate you guys on your championship. Now we have three pretty interesting topics to talk about. Uh, the first topic is going to be how the Warriors declined their invitation to the White House for the 2017 championship. Should college players be paid? And how the Olympics had the lowest ratings this winter. Um, today we have Brandon joining us today, Sarah and Marcos. So for the first topic, um, Brandon. So the Warriors declined the White House invitation for the 2017 championship. Basically, Trump stated a quote that says, uh, going to the White House is considered a great honor for a championship team. Stephen Curry is hesitating, therefore the invitation is withdrawn. What's your opinion on that? Well, um, obviously it's, tradi it's a tradition. Uh, they interviewed Clay Thompson, he said, he spoke and he said, yeah, they know it's a tradition, but they, they personally didn't feel comfortable going to the White House, so instead they took local children to African American uh, Museum and just, you know, so they can learn the history and everything like that. So that was a good experience. It was. Like. So before they basically declined the invitation, um, Stephen Curry was planning to meet up with the team mm -hmm. to vote on whether or not they should go to the White House. So before they can even make their vote, Trump had stated that quote. Do you think that it's wrong in the presidency side, you know, because I guess Stephen Curry was, it was a little bit of controversy because Trump was reaching out to um, NFL owners, telling him to uh, pretty much like fire the NFL players who don't do the uh, kneeling during the national anthem to fire them. So Stephen Curry was kind of on an uprise, and that's kind of how the controversy started. Do you think it's right on Trump's side to have his opinion in regards to the players, you know, kneeling and them not being able to go to pretty much the White House? Absolutely not. I feel like they should be entitled to do whatever they, they want to do. You know, they won a championship, so they, they should, you know, do whatever they want to do. Yep. Right. Awesome. So on to the ne next topic we have, should college players be paid? So Sarah joins us today. Um, with receiving tuition, room board, and scholarships, do you think that um, college athletes should be paid? Well, I'm not a student athlete, so everything I should say should be taken with a grain of salt. However, if a school wants to have someone on play for their team, tuition, board, things like that could be the least they could do if they're wanting them to represent their school. Um, I, I do think that they should be able to get paid. If a college wants to make that choice for themselves, that, hey, I want this person really bad to play for our team, they should be able to make that choice and not have it affect what they want to do. They're their own college. They should be able to do that. Right. So the NCAA profited $1 billion in 2017. Kids are sacrificing their lives while the NCAA is making so much money. What's your opinion in regards to that? That is definitely an interesting topic because some of these sports, especially when we get into like football and basketball, are so heavy in contact and there, there's a lot of talk about uh, traumatic brain injuries in football and stuff. So, so payment is, <laughs> like I said, one of the things that they can do to kind of compensate that they are such a public especially for these bigger schools they're such a public figure you have people who are diehard college football fans diehard basketball fans so i, I think payment is kind of due awesome thank you sarah on to marcos with our next subject uh the 2018 olympics for the winter was had the lowest rating since 2014. why do you think that happened i believe one of the reasons is mostly because in the winter olympics there's definitely less sports that people watch than in the summer Obviously, these Winter Olympics were in Pyeongchang, so there's obviously a time difference between South Korea and here. So I feel like that could also impact whether people would be or not just because of the time difference here. It could be five in the morning over there. It could be, you know, nighttime. So definitely people might not be as enthusiastic as wake to waking up at five in the morning to watch the games. Also, the United States came out at four in fourth place, where usually the United States comes in the top three and in this winter olympics it was norway germany and canada so i feel like that definitely had to do just because the united states or fans of the olympics are used to watching the united states win and in this winter olympics i feel like that wasn't the case you got it i would probably agree the same as well you know we're really popular with like basketball and swimming and i feel like that's what we're most interested in talking uh, talking about so that was pretty interesting thanks guys for joining us today now we'll send it back to the desk
Toby. Thanks for that great discussion, guys. You know, March is here when another weekend of NASCAR finds its way to Las Vegas. Our very own David Sepanian was there to cover all the action. NASCAR makes its way to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, and over 100,000 fans piled in for all the drama, but the race itself was anything but. The high-speed adrenaline rush of a stock car race is more than enough to bring fans into the stands, but NASCAR always goes the extra mile to make sure fans get an experience they won't forget. It's awesome, there's a live band, there's games, showgirls, so, and then obviously the NASCAR guys and the race. NASCAR has visited the Las Vegas Motor Speedway every year since 1997 and has been home to some of the most exciting and dramatic finishes in stock car racing. But that was missing this year when Kevin Harvick led for a track record 209 laps, becoming only the fifth driver with 100 NASCAR wins and never was in any serious danger of losing as Las Vegas native Kyle Busch finished nearly three seconds behind, giving Harvick his second win in Vegas following 2015. It's obviously been a lot of fun and, and to get, uh, personally get 100 wins uh, in, in the NASCAR uh, top three series is something that's pretty cool. Uh, these things are they're hard to win, so uh, to have cars like we've had the last couple of weeks says a lot about everybody at Stuart Haas Racing, and you just ride them when they're fast and, and hope, uh, hope you can close out the day, and today we did. I think it even surprised Kevin. It's like he said last week, he didn't realize he was so close to, to 100 wins either, but it just shows how good he's been in everything, you know, from cup cars to Xfinity cars, trucks. Uh, it doesn't matter what he drives. He, he knows how to win in him and uh, be successful. So uh, proud of him for that. I, I think it's a huge accomplishment. It's something he's really proud of. Regardless of the lack of an exciting finish, fans from across the country still showed up and enjoyed everything NASCAR weekend has to offer. From the festivities to the race itself, Having NASCAR visit Vegas twice a year sounds like an obvious decision. NASCAR and Kevin Harvick will race back to the Motor Speedway on September 13th. For the Rebel Report, I'm David Stepanian. Tickets for the NASCAR's return to Las Vegas in September are on sale now. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in. To stay up to date with all things UNLV and Vegas sports, make sure you follow us on our social media at Rebel Report UNLV on Twitter, at Rebel Report underscore UNLV on Instagram, and Rebel Report UNLV on Facebook. We leave you off with the plays of the week.